Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Many to whom the promise of the gospel is proposed and preached do or may, through their own sins, come short of the enjoyment of the things promised. The caution here given to the Hebrews, with the foundation of it and the example of those who did so miscarry, not only warrants but makes necessary this observation from the words. And I wish it were a manner of difficulty to confirm the truth of what is here observed. But what is affirmed is, but expressive of the state and condition of most of those in the world to whom the gospel is preached, they come short of all benefit or advantage by it. It ever was so, and it may be, for the most part, ever will be so in this world. The sentence of our Savior contains a lot and state of men under the dispensation of the gospel. Many are called, but few are chosen. It is true, faith comes by hearing, but bare hearing will not denominate any man a believer. More is required to this end. Men indeed would probably much esteem the gospel if it would save them merely at the cost and pains of others in preaching it. But God has otherwise disposed of things. Their own faith and obedience are also indispensably required to this end. Without these the promises, considered in itself, will not profit them, and as it is proposed to them, it will condemn them. What are the ways and means in which men are kept off from enjoying the promise and entering by faith into the rest of God? Observation 8. Not only backsliding through unbelief, but all appearances of quivocations and profession and occasions of them in times of difficulty and trials ought to be carefully avoided by professors, lest any of you should seem. Not only a profession, but the beauty and glory of it is required of us. We have often observed that it was now a time of great difficulty and of many trials to these Hebrew Christians. Such seasons are of great concern to the glory of God, the honor of the gospel, the edification of the church, and the welfare of the souls of men. For as in all the things of God and the interests of men in them have a public and, as it were, a visible transaction in the world, now, therefore, the apostle would not have the least appearance of equivocation or drawing back in them that make profession of the truth. So he gives us caution elsewhere with the same respect, Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. Walking circumspectly, redeem the time because the days are evil. The reason of both the duties enjoined is taken from the consideration of the evil of the days filled with temptations, persecutions, and dangers. Then in all things professors are to walk exactly, circumspectly, accurately. And there are two heads of circumspect walking in profession here in such a season. The first is to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Titus 2 verse 10 rendering the beautiful, lovely, comely, the doctrine of truth which we profess. This is a season in which, by all accurate circumspection in their walking and profession, believers ought to render what they believe, and profess glorious and amiable in the eyes of all. For these two ends, number one, that those who are of the contrary part, those that trouble and persecute them, may have to say of them, Titus 2 verse 8, no wicked, no foolish manner to lay to their charge. And though the conviction that falls upon ungodly men may have no effect upon them, but a secret shame that they should pursue them with wrath and hatred against whom they have no evil or foolish manner to say, but are forced openly to fall upon them in things only concerning the law of their God, as Daniel 6 verse 5, yet God makes use of it to check and restrain that wrath, which if it break forth would not turn to his praise, First Peter 3, verse 16. And number two, that others, 
who by their trials may be occasioned to a more diligent consideration of them than at other times, may by the ornaments put upon the truth be brought over to a liking, approval, and profession of it. In such a season, believers are set upon a theater and made a spectacle to all the world, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 9 to 13. All eyes are upon them to see how they will acquit themselves. And this is one reason when times of trouble and persecution have usually been the seasons of the church's growth and increase. All men are awakened to serious thoughts of the contest which they see in the world. And if thereon they find the ways of the gospel rendered glorious and amiable by the conversation and walking of them that profess it, it greatly disposes their minds to the acceptance of it. At such a season, therefore, above all others, there ought to be no appearance of equivocation or spiritual decays. The next head of circumspect walking in such a condition that no semblance of coming short may be given is a diligent endeavor to avoid all appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Everything that may give occasion to any to judge that we are fainting in our profession, things that it may be are lawful or indifferent, and any other time, things that we can produce probable and pleadable reason for. Yet if, through the circumstances that we are attended with, they may be looked on by persons of integrity, though either weak or prejudiced, to have an eye or show of evil in them are carefully to be avoided. Now there are two parts of our profession that we are to heed, lest we should seem to fall when times of difficulty attend us. The first is personal holiness, righteousness, and upright universal obedience. The other is a due observance of all the commands, ordinances, and institutions of Christ and the gospel. The Apostle Peter joins them together with respect to our accurate attendance to them in such seasons. Second Peter 3 verse 11 Seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conversations, that is, in every example of our converse or walking before God in this world? In this we meet with many changes, many temptations, many occasions, duties, and trials, and all which there ought to a thread of holiness run through in our spirits and actings. So it is expressed by holy conversations, which we have rendered by supplying all into the text. The word principally respects the godliness that is in religious worship, which constitutes the second part of our profession. And although the worship of God in Christ be one in general, and no other worship or Christians to touch upon. Yet because there are many duties to be attended to in that worship, many ordinances to be observed, and our diligent care is required about each particular instance, he expresses it in the plural number, godlinesses or worships, or as all godliness. About both these parts of profession is our utmost endeavor required that we seem not to fail in them. Many men may do so, and yet retain so much integrity in their hearts as may at last give them an entrance, as it were through fire, into the rest of God. But yet manifold evils ensue upon the appearance of their failings to the gospel, the church of God, and their own souls. To assist us, therefore, in our duty in this manner, we may carry along with us these following directions. Have an equal respect always to both the parts of profession mentioned, lest failing in one of them we be found at length to fail in the whole. And the danger is great in the neglect of this. For example, it is so lest while we are sedulous about the due and strict observance of the duties of instituted worship, a neglect or decay should grow upon us as to holiness, moral righteousness, and obedience. For while the mind is deeply engaged in exercise about those duties, either out of a peculiar bent or spirit toward them, 
or from the opposition that is made to them. The whole man is oftentimes so taken up with this is that it is regardless of personal holiness and righteousness. Besides the innumerable instances we have hereof in the scripture in which God charges men with their wickedness and rejects them for it, while they pretend highly to a strict observance of oblations and sacrifices, we have seen it manifoldly exemplified in the days in which we live. While men have contended about ordinances and institutions, forms and ways of religion, they have grown careless and regardless as to personal holy conversation to their ruin. They have seemed like keepers of a vineyard, but their own vineyard they have not kept. Many have we seen withering away into a dry, sapless frame under a hot, contending, disputing spirit about ways and differences of worship. While they have been intent on one part of profession, the other, of more importance, has been neglected. Number two, corrupt nature is apt to compensate in the conscience and neglect of one spiritual duty with diligence and another. If men engage into a present duty, a duty is a judge exceedingly acceptable with God and attended with difficulty in the world, they are apt enough to think that they may give themselves a dispensation and some other things, that they don't need to attend to universal holiness and obedience with that strictness, circumspection, and accuracy as seems to be required. Yea, this is the ruin of most hypocrites and false professors in the world. Let it, therefore, be always our care, especially in difficult seasons. In the first place, to secure the first part of our profession by a diligent attendance to all manner of holiness, in our persons, families, and all our whole conversation in this world, let faith, love, humility, patience, purity, charity, self-denial, weanedness from the world, readiness to do good to all, forgiving of one another and our enemies, be made bright in us and shine in such a season if we would not seem to come short. Because the difficulties in and oppositions that lie against the other part of our profession, with the excellency of the duties of it in such a season, are apt to surprise men into approval of themselves in a neglect of those important duties as was before observed. It is a sad thing to see men suffer for gospel truth with worldly carnal hearts and corrupt conversation. If we give our bodies to be burned and do not have charity, or are defective in grace, it will not profit us. We shall be but a sounding brass, or a tinkling cymbal, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. God has no regard to the observance of ordinances, where duties of holiness, righteousness, and love are neglected, Isaiah 1, 13 to 17. And in this day, whatever use we may be in the world, or to others, all will be lost as to ourselves, Matthew seven twenty one to 23. And we can have no expectation of strength or assistance from God in cleaving to the truth and purity of worship against oppositions if we fell in our diligent attendance to universal holiness. Here has been the original of most men's apostasy. They have thought they could abide in the profession of the truth in which they have been convinced, but growing cold and negligent in personal obedience, they have found their locks cut, and they have become weak and unstable as water. God, for their sins justly withholding the assistances of his spirit, they have become a prey to every temptation. Number four. What is it that we intend and aim at in our profession and our constancy in it? Is it not that in this and by this we may give glory to God and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel? If this isn't our aim, all our religion is in vain. If it be so, we may easily see that without personal universal holiness, we do on many accounts dishonor God, Christ, and the gospel by our profession, be it what it will. Here, therefore, let us fix our principal diligence that there be no appearance of any failure, lest we should seem to come short of the promise, John Owen.